This is going to be a study on the spirit world. And the first one we're going to look at is the seraphim. If you turn to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So this shows their location is above the throne, and their purpose is to give glory to God. This description of the seraphim seems to match the description of the four beasts in Revelation 4, 6 through 8. Because it says in Revelation 4, 8, and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. Not only this, but it also says, And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Most say this is cherubim, and I've thought it was before in the past, but the six wings matches the seraphim. And their location in Revelation is also at the throne of God. So these guys get to hang out with the Creator day and night. How awesome would it be to sit next to the throne of God? People are always wanting the best seats at NBA games and backstage passes at concerts, but none of these would compare to being able to physically sit next to God and see Him on His throne. If you think standing next to God and giving Him glory is boring, then that is because you haven't seen Him yet. That is what we are going to do for all eternity, is give praise to God. If you haven't read your Bible, and the Word of God isn't real to you, then you probably would rather just watch Netflix and chill, as people call it, or go out and do worldly things that have nothing to do with God or the Bible. People's mind is so much on worldly things that they don't think about spiritual things. They have no use for God and His book. And that is why most Christians have no idea about any doctrines in the Bible or anything about the spirit world but the next one we're going to look at is the cherubim these are creatures that only have two pairs of wings unlike seraphim which have the three pairs of wings they have four faces and this is one reason why I think they are different than the four beasts in Revelation 4 6 through 8 look back at Revelation 4 6 through 8 at the description or actually, Revelation 4, 7. It says, And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth, fourth beast was like a flying eagle. So this seems to be different, because in Ezekiel chapter 1, it describes these uh, cherubim like this. They have four faces on their head, the front face that of a man, the right side that of a lion, the left side that of an ox, and the back that of an eagle. They also have the hand of a man under their wings on each of their four sides. You can find this description in Ezekiel chapter 1. It seems that they hang around the throne of God as well. In Revelation, John mentions a rainbow round about the throne. And then in Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 28, Ezekiel says the appearance was like the appearance of a bow in the day of rain. So it seems that Ezekiel is showing that this is around the throne of God. But in the past, God put cherubims down on earth to guard the entrance into the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3.24. When Adam and Eve's children walked by and seen the cherubim, I'm sure they had some questions. And I seriously doubt there was any atheists when you could see a cherubim holding a flaming sword and Satan as Lucifer was a cherub and Ezekiel 28 14 calls him the anointed cherub that covereth so Satan got to hang out with God all day as well he wanted to go up but instead he goes down times five and it's crazy to think about a creature being that stupid that he would stand next to God for who knows how long of a time, but then end up rebelling 
and going against God. But the next one we are going to look at is the angels. And notice too that these are different from seraphim and cherubim. Those two aren't the same as angels. Angels are a completely different class. The Bible often times refers to angels as stars. So it isn't just the stars in space that God made in Genesis. The Bible talks about the stars in the sky being innumerable. God said to Abraham, tell the stars if thou be able to number them. God also says the angels are innumerable in Hebrews 12, 22. And then in Psalms 147, 4, it says, He telleth the number of the stars, he calleth them all by their names. God doesn't just know the names of stars you see in space, but also all the innumerable angels. Me and you only know two names of angels, and that's Michael and Gabriel. Michael represents the Jews. For things down here, there is a rep representation of it in heaven. And Daniel 10.13 says, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remain there with the kings of Persia. And then in Isaiah 24.21 it says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high, and the kings of the earth upon the earth. So you can see a connection between the host of the high ones, the principalities and powers in high places, with the kings of the earth. And then Ephesians 6.12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So kings down here have a representation up there. Just like in Acts 12.15, the people thought Peter was... Peter's angel. So Peter has an angel who represents him up there. And the Bible even talks about guardian angels. In Matthew 18.10 And there are still other kinds of angels and so they're not all just messengers as a lot of people think. Michael the archangel also has something to do with the resurrection from the dead. He disputed with Satan about the body of Moses in Jude verse 9. The Bible says he didn't bring Satan a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. And I'm not so sure if this is because he knew Satan was more powerful, or because Michael was just waiting on God's time for when he would defeat Satan. In Revelation 12, 7 through 9, it says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the dr great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So Michael prevails, and I mean either way he could be more powerful, or maybe God just juices him up and he gives Satan a one-hitter quitter. Here in Revelation 12, maybe God showed Michael Revelation 12, 7 through 9 when he was talking to Satan about the body of Moses and he knew he was going to get his chance to beat up the bad guy if he would just wait for the right time. But like I was saying, Michael has something to do with the resurrection from the dead. He disputed with Satan over the body of Moses and he is the only angel called Archangel. I don't recall it ever calling Gabriel an Archangel. But look at 1 Thessalonians 4.16. It says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So you have Michael associated with the dead rising. And then the only other angel who is mentioned by name is Gabriel, and he seems to inform people of important events. He speaks with Daniel in Daniel chapter 8 and 9, and he tells Zacharias about the birth of Jesus Christ's forerunner, John the Baptist, and later tells Mary about the birth of Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 1, 26 through 31. And then 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. 
So some angels are coming back with Jesus Christ along with us at the second advent. Notice the verse called them mighty. One angel could take on David's mighty men and the mighty men of Genesis 6 all by himself. And any angel by himself could take down Samson in an arm wrestling match or Goliath or King Saul. And just one angel killed 185 Assyrian, 85,000 Assyrians. And um, that was all in one night. Even though these are mighty angels, they are no match for the Creator. Colossians 1.16 says they were created. Not only this, but they were created for Him. God made things for His pleasure, but He won't make you worship Him. Did you know one angel is the one who puts Satan in the bottomless pit in Revelation 20? one through three so they're not just messengers if i had been created an angel i would be working real hard to earn the privilege of putting satan in the bottomless pit matthew twenty two thirty says they neither marry nor are given in marriage the verse also said we're going to be like the angels so it doesn't seem you'll be married to your husband or wife for all eternity as some people think and i'm sure some of you are glad about this but the angels neither marry nor are given in marriage. Many use this as a proof text to say they are sexless. Every angel is described as male in the Bible. And they aren't a bunch of fairies and fags, so they don't get married to each other. Also, since they don't die, and there is already a whole bunch of them on every corner, there is really no need for them to procreate. As I said before, they are innumerable. But next time you read through your Bible, note that every time it talks about an angel, it refers to them as male. Matthew 22.30 also said it is the angels of God in heaven that don't marry. But the angels who left their first estate are the ones who join themselves to strange flesh. As it, it talks about in Jude 1, six through 7 Let's go there and read it. It says, And the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. These angels that sinned did so back in Genesis 6 when they shacked up with the daughters of men. It says they took them wives of all which they chose. So I'm not sure if the women married them of their own free will or if they were forced. But I bet their dads weren't too happy them getting with these fallen angels. This also shows angels can sin and have a free will. And also shows us that the location of angels is not fixed to only being in heaven. So it seems some angels are in heaven, but some are still present tense reserved in everlasting chains in their darkness. The Bible says Jesus preached to the spirits in prison, and I believe this refers to him preaching to the fallen angels in everlasting chains. They have a future location being at the great white throne, being judged by us. Like Paul said, know ye not that we shall judge angels. And Jesus said himself, hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. Then the Bible talks about in Hebrews 13 too, how some have entertained angels unawares. And this is going to be most prevalent in the time of Jacob's trouble. If you miss the rapture, and I know most of you guys are counting on missing it now, then you are going to probably entertain some angels unaware. The angels which kept not their first estate are the same angels from Genesis 6-4. And the sons of God in Genesis 6-4 are obviously angels. If you search sons of God... An e-sword or sword searcher then you are going to find out the Bible is letting you know that these aren't men in the Old Testament they're angels you can tell who the sons of God are by comparing scripture with scripture Job 38 4 through 7 shows us that the sons of God were here when God laid the foundations of the earth showing that sons of God aren't regular men because if they are the godly line of Seth or any other type of man 
then how were they here when God laid the foundations of the earth before Adam was even here? I recently listened to a preacher that said that people who teach that the sons of God are angels also believe that Satan is Jesus Christ's brother, like the Mormons teach, which is a lie. I don't know any Bible believer who believes Satan and Jesus Christ are brothers. A lot of times these guys will tell a lie so they can ruin a Bible truth or try to discredit you with a lie so people think that you're crazy. But Satan is a son of God because he is a direct creation from God. Also, Adam is called a son of God because he didn't have an earthly father. We become sons of God when we are born again. In the Old Testament, men didn't get born again, so they weren't sons of God. So these sons of God aren't men. But the next one we're going to look at is devils. I believe the Bible distinguishes angels from devils. Many believe that the unclean spirits, devils, or demons, as most people call them, are the fallen angels. But I believe this is a completely different class altogether. Did you know the Bible doesn't say demons? It actually just calls them devils. There is one main devil, but many devils. Something that makes them different from angels is that they have wings. Zechariah 5.9 talks about two winged female devils. And that is another difference. All the angels are male. Also, the angels seem to look so much like men that you can't tell them apart from another man. You will find that this is so when you read about the angels appearing to Abraham and Lot in Genesis and about how we can entertain angels unaware. The devils look like something else entirely. In Matthew 12, 24, the Bible calls Satan Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Beelzebub means Lord of the Flies. And since about 2,000 devils infested the maniac in Mark 5, then the devils could possibly be really small winged creatures like flies. So bugs would be a type of devils. And the Bible talks about in Romans, the invisible things of him are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. The invisible things are revealed by things that are visible. God put, puts in plain sight the invisible things of the spirit world. Also those little angel statue things your grandma has all over her house would match the female devils in Zechariah 5, 9 more than they would match an angel since the angels are male without wings. The location of these unclean spirits seems to be going around and causing havoc on the earth. They are getting overtime hours more and more as time goes on because as Paul tells Timothy that in the latter times some should depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. In Revelation 18.2 it says, And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. The devil possession seems like it will be amped up in the tribulation time period. Notice the verse said, every unclean and hateful bird. Once again, likening devils to small winged creatures. God uses things you can see to describe to you what you can't see. Also notice that it says hateful bird. In the tribulation, it seems the angry birds will be playing the people instead of the other way around. The devils like to inhabit a body. And they like warm, wet places. So your body is their favorite choice to inhabit. And Luke eleven twenty four through 26, it says, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. He saith, I will return into my house. Whence I came out, and when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. He finds it swept and garnished, because while he was gone, the man gets mixed up in meaningless religion, and cleans his life up, but doesn't get salvation. So the last state of the man is worse than the first, for this reason. These verses also show us that some unclean spirits are worse, 
are more evil than others. I've heard stories about haunted houses where the spirits would do childish things like hiding items and knocking over plates, but never really did anything too evil. But then you have evil spirits that get in men and make them rape and torture young children. Mark 9.22 talks about how devils can throw a man into the fire and in water. And this is because they like warm, wet places. And that sounds like a beach. And then you have the maniac of Gadar that was possessed with the legion. And he ran around naked. And that's where you get nude beaches. I like what Phil Kidd said. He said, you people that walk around naked, you're crazy. You say, well, I only walk around half naked. Well, you're half crazy then. Because when the maniac put his clothes back on, it said he was clothed and in his right mind. He put his clothes back on after the demons came out, came out of him. And he was then in his right mind. The Old Testament calls them familiar spirits. And God expresses his dislike for them throughout the Old Testament. He tells men not to regard the familiar spirits and not to seek after those who consult with familiar spirits. So the location of devils seems to be causing havoc on earth and inside the bodies of men and women or even animals. Because when Jesus cast them out of the maniac, they went into the pigs. But these evil spirits can be sent from God, as it says in Judges 9.23, and people who don't know the true God of the Bible would call that blasphemy. This is because they spend their time reading junky Sunday school literature instead of the Bible. But verses like 1 Kings 22.22 22 talks about a lying spirit standing before the Lord. So at some point in time, there was an unclean spirit in heaven. The Lord put these lying spirits in the mouth of the prophets. And that is what he does today with preachers like Creflo Dollar, Paula White, Joyce Meyer, Joel Osteen, Rick Warren. Benny Rooster, and so on. He does this as a judgment on a people. If people want to reject what God says and don't really care what God has to say, then he will let them hear what they want to hear, and he will let their ears get tickled. So if the devils aren't fallen angels, then where did they come from? I really have no clue. Some believe they are the disembodied spirits of the giants of Genesis 6-4, since angels are spirit beings, they don't have souls, but yet they can take on human bodies. When they left their first estate and had children with human women, their offspring got a body from the woman and spirit from the fallen angel. So their offspring didn't have a soul. Now their spirits walk around looking for a body because they don't have one anymore. That's just someone's theory. I really have no clue where they came from. But it's interesting to try to figure it out. And a lot of people will say this is just a bunch of sci-fi stuff and you can't believe it and all this. That's because they have watched so many movies and the devil has convinced them in their head that anything that seems like supernatural or something sci-fi, that it can't be true. If they would just read the Bible and believe what it says, you're going to see all kinds of stuff that just doesn't seem real. Like Adam and Noah lived to be over 900 years old. How often do you see that in the time you're living in? And then if you read the book of Revelation and see all the creatures, like the creatures that come out of the bottomless pit in Revelation chapter 9, is that something that you see every day? You're going to have to realize that the world or the Bible doesn't just revolve around you and your little world that you live in there's different things that have happened in the past and different things that are going to happen in the future and just because you've seen this stuff on some sci-fi movie doesn't mean that it wasn't real or won't be real again in the future i think satan makes these movies to make the bible seem less real to people but the next one we are going to look at is satan as it says in Job 41, it calls him Leviathan, and that is Satan in his natural state. And Leviathan is in the deeps. So Satan in his natural state is Leviathan in the deeps. As I said before, he was the anointed cherub. As it talks about in Ezekiel 28, 
He is the God of this world because God let him run the world before Adam and Eve. His current location is walking to and fro in the earth. In Job 1, six, it talks, talks about Satan presenting himself before the Lord so he still has some access to heaven. Some future locations for Satan is inside the man of sin who becomes the son of perdition when Satan enters into him. Satan will later be chained in the bottomless pit by an angel, but loosed for a little bit after he assembles a rebellious army that is as the sands of the sea. He is defeated and cast into the lake of fire. And Satan falls five times in the scriptures. He fell the first time from the third heaven when he was the anointed cherub. He fell from the second heaven before Genesis 1-2. So he fell from the third heaven to the second heaven. He fell the second time from the second heaven to the first heaven. Sometime before Luke 10, 18, where Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. This is why he is referred to as the prince of the power of the air in Ephesians 2 and verse 2. And then in Revelation 12, 7, he falls the third time when he fights Michael. He falls from the first heaven to the earth. In Revelation 21 through 3, he falls the fourth time from the earth to the bottomless pit at the second advent. He finally falls the fifth time when he is cast into the lake of fire in Revelation 20 and verse 10. He had five I wills in Isaiah 14. Satan and devil both have five letters. The Bible says in Hebrews that Satan has the power of death. And death has five letters. I see five as the number of death instead of the number of grace. Christ's death was connected with five wounds and five pieces of garment. The animals that died in the Old Testament died on an altar that was five by five. The first man who ever died, died in Genesis 5-5. Five, five. Remember that Abel didn't just die, he was killed. And there are many examples of five being associated with death. But I hope this has given you a better understanding for the spirit world and that you will continue to study it for yourself in the Bible. No one is perfect, and I don't claim to be. We are all wrong somewhere, I assure you of that. If we weren't wrong somewhere, then we would be God. There is only one final authority, and that is the Bible. If you have a Bible to back up what you are saying, then you can claim it as absolute truth.